Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Fellow children of God, uh, some have said that we live in a disposable society. What they mean by that is there are so many things that aren't made to last anymore. They're made to be used just one time and then throw them in the garbage. This could include maybe a uh, silverware or utensils or something like that. This could maybe include, you know, single serving cups of yogurt or fruit that, you know, you eat it and then you, and you throw it away. But it goes beyond that. This can include things like cell phones, right? Uh, after two or three years, it seems like they just stop working and if you go and get a new one. And, and the old one isn't worth anything, right? If you, if you try to trade it in, it isn't going to get you very much. And I even heard it not too long ago, someone talking about certain models of cars as being disposable. You know, drive them for a couple of years, and when they break down, they're not worth fixing. Just go in and get something new. Now, on the one hand, this is a good thing for things like, you know, medical supplies, bandages, needles, stuff like that. It's a good thing we only use those once and then dispose of them. But on the other hand, for so many other things, it's, it seems to be such a waste, right? Especially when we hear about how landfills are, are, are filling up and the garbage just keeps piling up. Well, unfortunately, that, that idea of a disposable society to a certain extent has even crossed over to human life. Sometimes people see human beings as disposable. Sometimes people are ready to discard an unborn child just because, you know, the circumstances aren't right. Or, or maybe on the other end of the spectrum, sometimes people are ready to cut a person's time of grace short because, well, they're not contributing enough to society. Well, as we look at our scripture reading for this morning, we see that God has an entirely different attitude. God looks at us and he sees that we're not disposable. Instead, he looks at every person in this world and every person is a precious creation that came from his hands. Every person in this world is someone that Jesus loved enough to come into this world to be their savior. And so as we look at the parables that Jesus speaks in our lesson for this morning, we see that our Savior values every sinner. He values them so much that he rejoices over every sinner who repents, and he wants us to rejoice with him. We turn once again to Luke 15. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathered around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. But then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. Or suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. This is the word of our Lord. Well, as we find Jesus going around and teaching in our scripture reading for this morning, there, there's a couple different groups of people who are gathered around. On the one hand, there are those who are actually there to hear what Jesus had to say. They wanted to learn. They wanted to hear about the promises that Christ had been proclaimed. But on the other hand, there's another group that really weren't there just to learn what Jesus had to say. Instead, they were looking for a way to discredit Jesus. They're described in our lesson as 
the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. And they thought they had found the answer when they saw whom Jesus was associating. We're told that Jesus sat down to eat with sinners and with, with tax collectors. And it should be noted that when that term tax collector is used in the New Testament, it's a little bit different than what we think of today. During Jesus' day, they were notorious for being corrupt. And then on top of that, they were often Israelites working for the Roman government, for, for the enemy. And so that made them even more despicable in the eyes of, of so many. And for the Pharisees and, and the teachers of the law, these people were disposable. Right? They didn't have time. They wouldn't be caught associating with them at all because so many of those religious leaders saw these people as simply beneath them and not worth their time. And they couldn't imagine how a Messiah would want to waste his time on people like this. That's where Jesus steps in and he, and he uses these couple parables. And, and notice in the parable that the man who lost the one sheep, he could have lived without it. He had 99 more. Right? It wasn't like he wasn't going to be able to eat that night if he didn't go out and rescue that last sheep. And in the same way when we talk about the woman with the ten coins. It wasn't like she was down to her last penny. Instead, she had plenty else to replace it, if that was really the case. And, and also in the parable, notice that it wasn't really the shepherd's fault that, that that sheep wandered away. Sheep have a tendency to be not so smart. If you've ever worked with them, they're, they're really not the brightest animals. However, there was more there than just the monetary value of, of the sheep or, or the monetary value of the coins. These things were precious to the people because they were in their care. That shepherd, we can imagine that he sat and thought, Boy, what if that sheep was all out in the wilderness by itself? Not a very bright animal, couldn't really defend itself. What if it was left to the wild animals all alone? And his heart and his compassion went out to it. It wasn't because that sheep had anything to offer him. It was really simply his care and concern. And so he went after to find that, that lost sheep. Of course, the parable pictures the relationship between God and us. God created Adam and Eve. He placed them in the Garden of Eden. And he did it not because they really had anything to offer him. I mean, he could have been perfectly content living as God from eternity through eternity, but it was out of his grace that he created Adam and Eve, and it was out of his grace that he, he placed them in the Garden of Eden, this paradise that was prepared just for them. And, and when they fell into sin, when they rebelled against their creator, God could have easily said, all right, I don't need you. I'm going to wipe the slate clean. He could have let mankind be destined to the fate that it deserved, and, and he could have started all over again. But instead, even after his creation rebelled against him, God had compassion. He looked at Adam and Eve, and in turn, really, he looked at all of us. He looked at all of his creation and realized that we were helpless to help ourselves. We were like sheep without a shepherd. And if we were left on our own, there, there would be no one there to protect us, no one there to defend us. We would be Vulnerable. And so his compassion went out for us. And, and right after the fall of the sin, notice the promise that God had given. He said, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. 
He was talking to the devil, and he said, all right, this is the end. I am going to rescue my sheep. And these weren't just idle words because God followed through with that promise. When the time was right, Jesus left the safety of heaven. He's like that shepherd who went out into the world to rescue his sheep. And, and Jesus faced all the dangers of this world. He faced all the temptations that the devil could throw at him. He faced all the corruption that's, that's a part of this world. And he kept himself perfectly clean so that when the time was right, Jesus could lay down his life for the sheep. He could offer his life as a atoning sacrifice for our sins. As we read in the book of Hebrews, Now Christ has appeared once for all at the end of the ages to do away with sin by the sacrifice of his sheep. Christ came after his sheep and he paid the price to set them free. And not only did Jesus complete that work of salvation, not only did Jesus shed his own blood for the sake of these sinners who had rebelled against him, but he also went out into the world to call them back to himself. Jesus himself would later say, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. And the way that Jesus did that was by proclaiming that, that message of salvation. And so that's what we find Jesus doing here. When he, when he met to, went to meet with those sinners and with those tax collectors, he didn't do it just so that he could be friendly. He didn't condone their sin. He didn't just hang out like one of the guys. Instead, when he went those people, he, he went to them with law and gospel. He confronted them with their sins so that they could see the problem, so that they could see how it separated them from their God, and then he went on to tell them about how he came into this world to be the atoning sacrifice that would take away their guilt. And the way that Jesus continues to do that exact same thing is through the message of law and gospel that he continues to share with each one of us. And that's important because we, we need that message of law and gospel because on our own, we can never figure it out. You know, we could sit in the woods for a hundred years and, and just contemplate the universe. We could, we could pray to a, some sort of master builder to give us the answer, but without the word, the very best that we could come up with would be the idea that we have to work our way up to God. This is what's described in Proverbs as a way that seems right to a man, but in the end leads to death. But Jesus is the one who comes and seeks us out through the gospel, the word, and sacrament, so that through these means of grace, Jesus can pick us up and carry us home to be a part of his kingdom. And in addition to the work that Jesus does to bring us to be a part of his family, when our Lord leads a soul to repentance, he calls everyone in heaven together to rejoice. That's, that's one part of the story that's sort of interesting. When, when the man owned his lost sheep, he didn't just keep it to himself, but he brought his buddies along and said, look, I found my lost sheep. Or when that woman found her coin, she brought her friends together and said, look, rejoice with me, for what is lost has been found. God does that for us. Imagine that. Of all the people in this world, there's lots of them, right? Seven billion or something like that. Out of all these people in this world, God rejoiced. He took time to rejoice when you were brought to faith. The angels in heaven rejoice, whether that was at the baptism font where through the waters of grace God washed your sin away, whether that was maybe later in life when, when you heard about Jesus and finally the Holy Spirit made it click so that you understood the forgiveness Christ had won was one for you, or, or, or maybe it was 
after drifting away from God and his word for a while, the Holy Spirit gently led you back to see the wonderful promises that are contained in Scripture. Whatever the case was, when God welcomed you into his family, all of heaven rejoiced. That's how much God loves you. In God's kingdom, there are no disposable people. But by his grace, as we're told, God our Savior wants all men to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. And just as the Lord rejoices over every sinner who is brought into his kingdom, who is led to repentance, the Lord wants us to do the very same thing. As we live and serve in God's kingdom, we can reflect that same attitude that Jesus showed to all the people around us. No matter who we meet, we can remember this person that's standing before me. This is someone who's loved by the Lord. This is someone who God loved enough to send his son to be their Savior. And through the same law and gospel that Jesus proclaimed, we can share with them that message of salvation that God has accomplished for them. That doesn't mean that we condone sin. That doesn't mean we overlook sin. That doesn't mean we, we change God's law to fit into the modern attitudes of society. Instead, that does mean we show sin in order that we can point them to their Savior. And once they see their Savior, we can rejoice with the angels in heaven that they're brought from the darkness of sin into the light of God, <clears throat> excuse me, into the light of God's salvation. And not only do we strive to share God's word with, with those who have never heard it before, but also as we see people who have drifted away, we can take the opportunity God gives us to encourage them, to, to welcome them back into God's family, to remind them of the grace that God had shown to them, to remind them of the promise that God made to them at their baptism. And once again, when God does his incredible work of changing hearts, we can join with the angels to rejoice because it's by God's grace alone that the lost are found, the lost are rescued to be a part of God's kingdom. And this means that we can share the gospel with our family, parents with their children, with brothers and sisters, with, with friends, with neighbors, with, with anyone that we need, really. And we can trust that through the same law and gospel that has brought us to be a part of God's family, the Holy Spirit will continue to work so that many more can be brought into the kingdom of God. And then once again, there is rejoicing in the presence of angels of God over one sinner who repents. What joy fills our heart to know that even though we live in a disposable world, not one of us is disposable. Each and every one of us is precious in God's sight. Each one of us is loved enough that God was willing to send his son into this world to become our Savior. May we always remember the tremendous value Christ has put on us. May we remember the new life that he has provided for us through the gospel and word and sacrament. And may we rejoice because the Lord values every sinner. Amen. Now may this grace of God which surpasses all human understanding keep your hearts and your minds in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.